we have been in being as a party for longer than any other democratic party in Western Europe. We've won more elections, we've lost a few on the route, but we've won more elections and we have perhaps served in government longer, more often, and better in the interests of our country than any other democratic yeah. Yeah. Order, order. I'm sure that the whole House would want to join me in sending their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, our warmest congratulations on the birth of their son. Order. Questions to the Secretary of State for Defence. Julie Elliott. Number one, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State for Defence, Secretary Gavin Williams. Mr Speaker, I'd very much like to associate the Government with your comments and warm wishes. I'm sure the whole House would also wish to join with me in offering our sincere condolences to the family and friends of Sergeant Max Tonroe, who died while on operations on the 29th of March. He served his country with great distinction, and his service will never be forgotten. The SDSR created a national security objective to promote our prosperity, and we are committed to supporting a thriving and internationally competitive defence sector. We have now published our national shipbuilding strategy, refreshed the defence industrial policy, and work is underway to develop a combat air strategy. Exports are central to our approach, and British industry, working with the government, is looking at how we can exploit those opportunities. Julie Elliott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, As you know, the defence industry supports over 100,000 jobs directly in the UK and many more um, indirectly. Will the Secretary of State put in some meaningful measures to consider economic and employment practices when making contract decisions? Um, I would be very happy to look at uh, those options. Um, I would hate to correct the Honourable Lady, but uh, actually the defence industry is a quarter of a million who are working in the defence industry, not just supporting uh, the UK, but actually uh, exports as well. Uh, I would also encourage the Honourable Lady to actually have a dialogue with my right honourable friend, the member for Ludlow, who is doing a a piece of policy work as to how we can work closer with industry, promoting prosperity. James Gray. Mr Speaker, while of course it's quite right that the government should do everything they can to support the British defence industry, the truth of the matter is it's an international business. And in our area in the South West, it's Boeing and it's Airbus and it's Leonardo, all of them foreign owned, who are the main employers and the main contributors. And also the F 35, bless it, which is such a fantastic aeroplane, it's made in America, but 15% of the total value of that plane comes in Britain, enabling us to buy the planes ourselves. Thank you, uh, the Honourable Gentleman makes a very important point about the international nature of our defence industry. And what we have to be doing is looking more and more as to how we can develop partnerships with international businesses and when we're looking at procurement decisions, how we can deliver the best value not just for the MOD but also the very best for jobs here in the United Kingdom. Kevin Jones. So, can I ask the Secretary of State what discussions had with the Treasury? Uh, about the warden of uh, contracts, because the Treasury take a view that somehow lowest price is the best way forward. In fact, in many cases, money comes back to the Treasury straight away in tax NI. Is that not something we should be taking into account when we're awarding contracts? I think the right honourable member raises a very thoughtful point about actually how we look at the whole defence procurement argument as to what are the real benefits uh, to UK PLC. And I think it's something that we should start to look at. Different countries have a different approach. If you look at Germany, Mr Speaker, Germany has quite a different approach to this than the United Kingdom. What lessons could we learn as a government and what approaches can we adopt? Mr. Philip Hollabone. Uh, whilst we're developing new armoured vehicles, ships and planes, what progress is actually being made on exporting those platforms overseas? So you stay. Well, it is one of the key aims and priorities of the Department to promote prosperity for the whole of the United Kingdom, and a key element of that is exports. In the last 10 years, we've seen over £70 billion worth of exports. We've had the recent uh, very positive news in terms of Qatar signing up for £5 billion for the typhoon, 
good progress being made with the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and further pre- progress being made with Belgium. We're also in very detailed discussions with the Australian Government over Type 26 uh, uh, frigates, which we hope that we may be able to make some progress in persuading them to look at buying those in the future. The Hughes. Mr. Speaker, let me join you in congratulating the Countess and Earl of Strathairn on the birth of a healthy child, especially today on the feast day of George, the patron of England. I wonder, Mr. Speaker, if the Secretary of State would join me and those on these benches in welcoming NATO allies to Scotland for an exercise joint warrior. Beyond the all too rare sight of complex warships in Scottish waters, would you also agree that it is a suitable time? to remind ourselves of the centrality of the North Atlantic to the security of these islands, and will he reassure all of the benches in this House of that centrality will be reflected in the Modernising Defence Review? I would like to reassure the Honourable Gentleman there is nothing unusual about British warships being all around the coast of the United Kingdom. And, of course, we are very proud uh, in terms of the naval base at Clyde and the central role that that plays to our nuclear deterrence. Uh, We are very conscious of the increasing threat that Russia poses in the in the North Atlantic, and that is why we have been making such an investment in terms of Poseidon aircraft and the announcement of £132 million being spent at RAF Lossiemouth. And I was very pleased that my honourable friend was able to join me at Lossiemouth just the other week, uh, highlighting this important investment. Mr. Martin, Dr. Hughes. I thank the Secretary. It may I also uh, associate these benches with the comments he made about Sergeant Munro earlier, uh, a few moments ago. Uh, one of the ships that came alongside in the Clyde, actually in Glasgow last week, was Her Majesty's Danish ship, the Nice Yule, which, like all frontline support ships of the Danish Royal Navy, is designed and built in Denmark. If small northern European countries of five million people can design and build all their naval support vessels at home, then it is astonishing to me that the Government cannot, or maybe will not, do the same. Can the Secretary of State therefore address the crucial issues of national security and taxpayer value which underline the plea for shipbuilding unions last week? Thank you. Secretary of State. At the moment, we are under the current construction of Prince of Wales, which is currently at Rosyth, and a major investment. And it is also to be celebrated the fact that uh, our commitment to the eight Type 26 uh, frigates. And just, uh, just the other week, I was at Govan and seeing the major investment that we are making there. This investment in Scottish shipbuilding is something that I thought you would be celebrating as against sort of trying to detract away from. David. Yeah. Mr Speaker, can I associate the loyal opposition with uh, your comments sir, regarding the royal birth? Can I also uh, extend our condolences to the family of Sergeant Mark Trunron? Within the next few weeks, the Government will have to make the final decision on how to handle the order for the fleet solid support ships. Given that this huge contract could be worth 6,700 jobs for British shipyards, and with huge benefits for the supply chain, does the Secretary of State accept that there is a very strong case indeed for the contract to be awarded to British shipyards? Would you stay? Um, well, I would like to thank the comments from Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Um, and in terms of uh, our commitment to shipbuilding, we have one of the greatest commitments to shipbuilding in this country. We are not only just seeing this in terms of the Type 26, but it is also in the Type 31E. This is a great opportunity for shipyards right across the United Kingdom to take part in these contracts. And what we will be doing is looking at every stage as to how we can do the very best in terms of jobs and opportunities. Pauline Latham. Number two, sir. Yeah. You stay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, the Department regularly looks at CBRN capability as part of the annual financial planning round. The MOD will consider its overall CBN, CBRN capability uh, as part of the modernising defence programme. 
The Secretary of State is seeking to group this question with that from the Honourable Gentleman Member for Horsham. And I'd like to group it with number 12. Thank well you for the correction, Mr. OK. Pauline Latham. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, Secretary of State for that answer. Could he update the House on the <coughs> continuing uh, contribution of MOD personnel now that the urgent response to the Russian chemical attack in Salisbury has moved into the recovery and clean-up stage and confirm that our armed forces have everything they need to continue to keep all our constituents safe from such attacks in the future? Secretary of State. Um, uh, very much so, and I think it's very pleasing to be able to report of the progress that Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey and Sergei and Yulia Skripal have made since that attack. And let us not forget the important role that the Ministry of Defence has played and our armed forces in terms of assisting the police with their investigations, uh, of which over 170 arm, armed forces personnel were involved, and as part of a clean-up. Due to our unique capabilities, it is uh, 192 British service personnel who are going to be involved in this clean-up operations in Salisbury. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'm aware from constituents who work locally for TARLIS that the UK is investing in a state-of-the-art biological surveillance system. Given the horrific attack uh, on British soil, an innovation attack, would the Minister confirm that uh, we have sufficient resources in his department to meet these kind of attacks, whether that's at home or indeed on our forces overseas? I can confirm that is the case, but what we are doing is we are stepping up our investment. We are making a substantial investment in terms of our capabilities and our uh, facilities at Port and Down, which is going to ensure that we continue to preserve our world-leading position and expertise in this field. McLean. Oh, sorry, Rachel Maskell, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I don't wish to confuse York and Redditch, and I apologise to the Honourable Lady. I feel I know her very well. I shouldn't have made that mistake. But Rachel Maskell, please. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Can I ask the Government how they are working with the UN Security Council and organisations like the OPCW in identifying stockpiles of of chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear capability across the globe and what steps they are taking to see de-escalation of this? Well, we have always worked incredibly closely with them, and it's a shame that other nations, such as Russia, have not always had such a positive and collaborative relationship with them. Uh, We work very closely in sharing our expertise and our knowledge, and we've been incredibly open with them in making sure that they have a clear understanding of the threats and dangers that this country faces as a result of Russia's uh, hostile act. Ms Winston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We do need to invest in our defence capabilities against changing and emerging threats in warfare, one of which is the unchecked use of lethal autonomous weapons. Has the Secretary of State seen last week's House of Lords report on artificial intelligence, which concludes that the UK's definition of lethal autonomous weapons is clearly out of step with the definitions used by most other governments, which makes it harder to reach international agreement on regulation? Will he commit to reading that and revising the, the definition? Um, Currently, um, as has been pointed out, there is no defined uh, and agreed international uh, um, agreement on this, and this is something that we do need to work very rapidly towards, and I will certainly be very committed in terms of trying to reach that agreement at the earliest possible stage. Mark, give me a question three, please. Minister Tobias Elwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As we mark 100 years since the end of World War I, it is appropriate to once again underline our appreciation to the charities that support the armed forces community. Mr Speaker, you will be aware that many of the household names, such as Royal British Legion, Blesma, Combat Stress, SAFRA and so forth, were formed around this time to look after the thousands of injured returning to Britain. I meet and engage with charities weekly, as does the Secretary of State, who last week visited Tedworth House, the excellent recovery centre run by Help for Heroes. Alan Mack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Royal British Legion does play a key role in supporting our veterans, including on Armed Forces Day, where we celebrate their role across the country. Will the Minister um, join me in congratulating them on their work and also come and visit the Haven't branch when his <laughs> diary allows? How could I refuse such an invitation, Mr Speaker? I'd be delighted. And could I also underline his support for the Armed Forces Day? It is something that I hope all honourable members will look at to see what they can do in their area to attend this important event. 
Mr Gavin Robinson. Mr Speaker, and can I associate this bench with the uh, wonderful news shared by Baron and Baroness Carrick Fergus? The Minister uh, <laughs> should know. <laughs> The Minister should know that the Defence Select Committee is currently looking at the support available for serving and former personnel. Does he recognise the geographical difficulties and the legacy of security concerns affecting those veterans who live in Northern Ireland? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I had the pleasure of attending the Defence Select Committee uh, and was able to discuss these matters. Uh, I also had the pleasure of visiting Belfast, where he is aware that I took a look at what support needs to be provided and furthered uh, in order to uh, deal with the particular situation uh, that we have there. But I hope that that will be ongoing, and I, myself, or the Secretary of State will be able to visit uh, in the near future. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask my right hon. Friend to give more support, the Minister of Defence to give more support for Care After Combat, the excellent charity that goes into prisons and helps people who have been much affected by combat. Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm grateful for my honourable friend to raising the importance of working with those that are in prisons. COPSIO, the confederation that looks after all the, uh, the, the uh, armed forces charities, is br- bringing together clusters of support in the justice sect- sector. And I uh, met with those uh, charities, and we're seeing what more we can do to provide support for those that are in prison. Earl Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's disgraceful treatment of the Windrush generation has caused deep anxiety and distress to those who have emigrated from Commonwealth countries and who have served, served in our armed forces. It cannot be right that veterans who fought for this country are now frightened that they could be deported due to the callous immigration policy that this Prime Minister has spearheaded. So could the Minister outline what concrete action the MOD is taking to help rectify this scandalous state of affairs? Minister. He makes an interesting observation. The first thing I would say is that this Government has apologised and will continue to apologise to those affected by this current situation. A task force has been set up uh, in the Home Office to deal with this, and as I said on the weekend, uh, we apologise for what we have done. I hope successive previous Governments will do the same, because this was a collective effort of making the bureaucracy getting in the way, not looking after those people who are very much Britons and are, should be allowed to continue to live here. If there are any veterans that are affected by this, then I will be more than delighted to look into this to make sure that we can underline our support for these people who are very much British citizens. Um, Question number four, please, Speaker. Secretary of State. Uh, Russian military activity has been more assertive over the last few years. It has pursued a 10-year programme of military modernisation that has bolstered its armed forces. We recognise the importance of responding with allies and partners, and this has been the strength in our united action following the Salisbury attack. We are enhancing our deterrence and defence policies, especially through NATO, to prevent Russian aggression. Gillian Keegan. I thank the Secretary of State for that answer. The National Cyber Security Centre described Russia as our most capable hostile adversary in cyberspace, and they recently released a joint technical alert with the FBI and Homeland Security about malicious cyber activity carried out by the Russian government. Can my right hon. Friend give an update on the progress he has made on improving our active cyber defence to protect government networks, industry and individuals from high-volume cyber attacks? Secretary of State. Um, the hon. Lady is very absolutely correct to highlight this increasing threat. and The government has spent uh, £1.9 billion and is committed to spending that in order to ensure that our defences are in the best possible place. But as the nature of warfare starts to change and as the threats increase, we have to be realistic about the fact that actually uh, cyber and conventional forces, increasingly these two areas and realms, are going to start merging more and more. So we shouldn't just think about the importance of defending ourselves against cyber security. It's also conventional forces as well. John Woodcock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Russian submarines are increasingly aggressive. So is the contract for Astute Boat 7 now signed? And is he alive to the need to accelerate future capability research so that we can get back on top in this arena? Secretary of State. Well, I very much hope to be able to update the House and uh, the Honourable Member uh, in in the not too uh, distant future, Uh, but we are very conscious of the importance uh, of uh, our deterrence, uh, which is absolutely pivotal for keeping this country safe, and our 
Our submarines in the North Atlantic are absolutely central to that. Uh, Dr Julian Lewis. When the threat from Russia receded at the end of the Cold War, we understandably cut our defence budget down to a level of 3% of gross domestic product. Given events from Salisbury to Syria demonstrating that sadly this threat is now reappearing, should we not be seeking to get back to that sort of level of defence expenditure? And will he lay this pertinent fact in front of the <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer? Secretary of State. Oh, right, honourable gentleman, does try to tempt me. Um, um, <laughs> We have to be realistic about the fact that the threat picture is changing. We've seen it uh, escalate quite considerably since 2010, even from 2015, and we have to make sure that we have the right capabilities to do that. Uh, That is why we're doing the modernising defence programme, in order to deliver the right type of capabilities for our armed forces to deal with that increasing threat that we face. And we have to be realistic about uh, the challenges. Uh, The challenges that are posed by Russia are far greater than the challenges that were presented as an insurgency in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan. And how do we get the right mix of military equipment and capability to deal with that increased threat? The cannot be accused of excluding from his answers any consideration which might in any way at any time to any degree be considered material for which we are immensely grateful. However, there is a premium upon time because we've got a lot of questions to get through. Neo Griffith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, given the increased activity of Russian submarines in our waters and our reliance on allies for maritime patrol support, will the Secretary of State now admit that it was a gross mistake back in 2010 to cut our maritime patrol aircraft without a planned replacement, leaving us without that capability for nearly a decade? Mr Speaker, I suppose it's having spent time in the Whip's office. uh, It's for freedom to get out onto the floor. It's obviously a shock and we get too verbose. Um, uh, I I don't accept that it was a mistake and I'm very proud that we're investing so much in terms of a new Poseidon aircraft to make sure that we have this exciting new capability that's able to support our forces in the North Atlantic. The, The Secretary of State is uncaged. (laughs) <laughs> and there is much to be said for that. He's uncaged. Yeah. Indeed. Neil Griffith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I do remain concerned that the government has not learned the lessons of the past when it comes to cutting capabilities, leaving serious gaps in our defences, only to have to replace them further down the line. So will the Secretary of State confirm today that the modernising defence programme will not cut our Albion-class amphibious warships before their out-of-service dates of 2033 and 2034? Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, There are many, many very honourable and right honourable members on the opposition benches who care so incredibly passionately about our armed forces and will continuously do all they can do to support our armed forces. And I know that the honourable lady is very much one of those. But when we talk about the risks and threats that are sometimes posed to our armed forces, I sometimes think that uh, we should be worried about the leader of the opposition um, a little bit more than anything else. Um, We are looking, in terms of a modernising defence programme, as all our capabilities, how we ensure that we are able to adapt to the increasing challenges and the increasing threats. But I'm not going to prejudge that programme. Uh, We're going to look at the evidence and look at the information that comes from the public and the much wider defence community. Sir Desmond Swain. Number five. E. Minister of State Mark Lancaster. With permission, Mr Speaker, I should like to answer questions 5 and 14 together. I discuss Armed Forces recruitment regularly with the principal personnel officers of each service and with the Chief of the General Staff. Implementation of the Recruitment Improvement Plan is a priority, and I am monitoring it very closely. Sir Desmond Swain. So how will he recruit and retain sufficient engineers? Minister. 
Well, my right honourable friend makes a very important point, and this is precisely why, for example, in the Royal Navy, uh, we have associations with technical colleges, or indeed uh, within my own corps, the Royal Engineers, where I think we have a tremendous offer, where uh, young recruits are not only enrolled as apprentices, uh, but they are also trained not only as infantry soldiers, but also in specialist engineering trade skills, such as bricklaying, uh, um, or electricians, um, or indeed carpenters. Mary Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A constituent of mine, Mr. Lum, served in the Army for 43 years, 13 of the last years being spent in recruitment. Contract changes meant, however, that in January this year he was discharged 72 days before his 60th birthday and his planned retirement date. He tells me that despite senior officers seeking to find him employment, that um, the, the contract date was, was fixed. Um, so he lost 72 days of his pension. Um, could the Minister please look carefully at how Capita is fulfilling its contract so that the recruitment personnel are not disadvantaged? Minister. Well, my honourable friend is a champion for her constituency, and as she knows, I wrote to her on the 26th of March regarding this matter, and I'd be delighted to meet again uh, with her if she has any further questions she wishes to raise with me. But in general terms, we work very closely with Capita, and I've said before at the dispatch box how we are looking at moving to a more regional recruiting mechanism with uh, ensuring that we have young role models. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I congratulate the Honourable Member on New Forest for getting this question on a day when Capita have announced a half a billion pound loss? And that comes as no surprise when we look at the mess they're making of the, rec of the recruitment project. And that is actually not a channel for recruitment, but a logjam against uh, recruitment. Huge delays, many people losing interest in, in, in the meantime. Will the Minister admit this contract has failed? It's time to bring it back in house. Minister. I don't accept that. I've looked at this incredibly carefully. I've met with the Chief Executive of Capita now uh, on several occasions, and indeed I am convinced uh, that we continue to work very closely with Capita. They are investing large amounts of money. There have been challenges, there's no doubt about it, with the introduction of the new defence recruiting system. The manual workarounds have worked, and, but I've seen firsthand now how most of those issues have been addressed, and I'm confident in future months that we will move forward with this contract. See, Lucas. Mr. Speaker, does he think that decisions like moving the Remy HQ from the proud military town of Wrexham to yet another base in the M4 corridor incentivises recruitment in places like North Wales or puts people off? Minister. Well, I think it's important that through the um Army 2020 review that we do begin to bring units together because that gives greater stability. What I would say uh, to the honourable gentleman's constituents is it's not only the remit that they can join in the armed forces. Mark Francois. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Capita's performance on the Army recruiting contract has been distinctly suboptimal. <laughs> Such that throughout the army they are now almost universally known by the unfortunate nickname of Crapita. <laughs> given the company's half a billion pound loss this morning, given that they have debts of £1.7 billion, pounds, and given that they are rumoured to be preparing a £700 million pounds rights issue, what assurance can the Minister give the House that we have a plan B in place in case they were unfortunately to go the way of Carillion Amy? Well, Minister! I, well, can I start by uh, thanking my right honourable friend, uh, not least for his report filling the ranks, which has made a major contribution in addressing some of the issues that we faced over recruitment, some of which are way beyond the realms of any contract with Capita, but are, are, are as a result of the changing dynamics of the British population. But I accept his broader point that there have been challenges within this contract. And if he's asking me if I am confident that we have a business continuity plan in case things go absolutely awry, which I do not think they will, then yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister agree that the armed forces used to have the reputation for the best trainers in our country? They were admired everywhere. Is he also aware that the number of people coming to our armed forces with those highly specific engineering skills that we need, and my father was a royal engineer, is dire at the moment? We need recruitment and we need it now. Minister. 
<laughs> well, the Honourable Gentleman builds on my Honourable Friend for New Forest Point earlier, and I think this is the point where we have a number of schemes in place now, partnerships with technical colleges, uh, ensuring that all new recruits, uh, recruits are enrolled on apprentices' uh, ships. There are few careers where you can l- start with minimal qualifications and leave as a level six apprenticeship, that's degree level in engineering. And I'm very proud that the armed forces continue to offer that opportunity for our young people. I think Paul Blomfield. Number six, Mr. Speaker. How is it the government will do this? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Secretary of State of Defence visited the Clyde last Thursday to witness the completion of the first Type 26 unit. These units will form part of the first ship, HMS Glasgow, which is due to be accepted by the summer of 2025. The Royal Navy will then train and prepare her, and she will enter service in 2027. HMS Cardiff, HMS Belfast, and the remaining five ships will then follow. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will know that Sheffield companies have been key to the Royal Navy's supply chain since we've provided the tools to build Britain battleships like HMS Victory. He will also know that there have been three HMS Sheffields. One started with the serving with distinction uh, from the Arctic to the Mediterranean in the Second World War. But the last was decommissioned in 2003. Does the Minister agree it would now be right to recognise the City's contribution to the Navy by naming one of the Type 26 frigates HMS Sheffield? Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for his question, and indeed uh, uh, the Honourable Member has written on this issue to the Secretary of State. Uh, the process by which the ships are named is understood by the Honourable Member, and I agree entirely that the City of Sheffield has, a, has every right to be uh, considered uh, as, a, uh, as a potential uh, city to be named in terms of the Type 26, but the process will be followed as per the usual manner. Speaker, the Minister will be aware that on Monday, after much talk between Plymouth and Portsmouth, I launched a campaign to bring all of the Type 26s port, uh, based in uh, Plymouth. Would my uh, honourable friend agree to meet with me and a leadership team from Plymouth to outline why this key city uh, in, this nation's, uh, in this nation's crown deserves to have these ships port based there? Grateful. Well, I thank my honourable friend for his question. Of course, I'd be more than delighted to, to meet with my honourable friend and a delegation from Plymouth. I was very pleased to visit Plymouth. I was very impressed with what I saw, the work that was being undertaken, for example, on the refurbishment of the Type 23. So it would be a pleasure uh, to meet that delegation from the great city of Plymouth. Evans. Mr Speaker, given that the Type 26 is our currently being built by the greatest shipbuilders in the world in the Govan shipyard. Can I also confirm what the timetable will be for the Type 31 frigate and whether that will be built in Govan too? Minister. Well, certainly the Type 31 process is, is well underway. Uh, we're very pleased with the number of consortia who have shown an interest in the Type 31, and I certainly hope that the uh, Clyde shipbuilders will be putting in a very good price, which will ensure that the Type 31 will be delivered on time and on schedule. Andrew Percy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we're going to have a HMS Sheffield, we must certainly have a HMS Ghoul, because we are, after all, a port. Uh, but uh, more importantly, with Australia and Canada both likely to make decisions on Type 26 uh, this year, in the coming weeks or months, does my friend agree with me that actually getting those contracts will ensure that we have C to C to C interoperability, uh, potentially also with New Zealand? Having four of the five Five Eyes powers on the same platform would be a powerful, powerful message. Well, I agree entirely with my honourable friend. I think the opportunity for Type 26 in terms of partnership working with Australia, Canada and perhaps New Zealand is a really important opportunity uh, for us. I think the campaign in Australia has been strong, it's been positive, it's been upbeat, and I sincerely hope that it will be successful. Cummins. Question number seven, Mr Speaker. Minister Elwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the House will be aware, we are developing new options for service personnel with regards to accommodation. The programme is called the Future Accommodation Model, and we hope to run a pilot of the programme towards the end of the year. I think the Minister was seeking to group this with question number 23. Mr Speaker, with your permission, could I group this question with number 23? Well done. Thank you. Judith, come in. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are serious problems in the private rented sector surrounding affordability, quality and security of tenure. Does the Minister share my concern that splitting our forces communities by pushing service families into the private rented sector risks reducing their quality of accommodation and life, as well as impacting on retention and recruitment rates? Uh, Mr Speaker, the way... The Honourable Lady has phrased her question. Allow me, if I may, correct. Nobody will be forced to do anything. It's an option uh, available to them. We are providing more choice for our armed forces personnel 
whether they choose to stay on the base, whether they choose to rent, or indeed whether they want to get on the housing ladder and purchase a property as well. Now, of course, house prices, Mr. Speaker, vary up and down the country. We need to make sure that there is a process there uh, available to make sure there is a subsidised capability so nobody is left out of pocket. There is choice available. Nobody will be forced to undergo any of this accommodation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Service families in Woolwich are understandably anxious about what the future accommodation model might mean for them, but the immediate concern of many is the poor service they regularly receive from Carillion Amy. Can ministers tell us what they're doing here and now to improve the quality of the subcontractor's maintenance and repair service? Again, Mr. Speaker, his question gives me licence just to clarify the longevity of what is happening at Woolwich. He will be aware that there is a uh, proposal uh, to close the actual base itself by uh, 2028, and the Royal Anglins will move, as will the Royal Horse Artillery. There is time between then, uh, now and then, and we need to make sure that we look after our armed forces personnel. He is also aware that we have had problems with the Amy Carillion uh, uh, deal. Uh, The last uh, Defence Secretary called the company in to say things were not up to par, uh, but we are working to make sure that contracts are met. Mearson. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that most young people in the armed forces don't want to rent, they want to buy? And can he say uh, what more can be done to support the forces help to buy scheme, which appears to be quite successful? Minister. He's absolutely right, and the Help to Buy, to scheme, uh, help to buy scheme is a very uh, critical part of the programme that we're rolling out. The pilot scheme will begin at the end of the year, and this, again, is uh, feedback from the Armed Forces Federations to give Armed Forces personnel and their families the choice that they're calling for. Reader and Bailey. Number eight, Mr Speaker. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Ministry of Defence is working closely with the defence industry to understand the implications and opportunities presented by the UK's departure from the European Union. Uh, through our future partnership with the European Union, we want to explore how our industries can continue working together to deliver the capabilities that we need. It is, however, worth noting that current major European collaborative capability projects, such as Typhoon, are managed bilaterally or with groups of partners rather than through the EU. Irene Bailey. Last month, we heard that the UK could no longer participate in the Galileo satellite programme post-Brexit. This is a huge blow for our industry as a whole, and in particular our defence capabilities. Can the Secretary of State tell us just what he's doing about it? Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for the question, and I do agree with him that the issue in terms of Galileo is concerning. Uh, we have made representations at the highest level uh, to both uh, the European Union and also to the French Government. Uh, we believe that this is an important issue. We believe that the UK contribution to the Galileo programme is significant. Uh, but I think the Honourable Member would agree with me that the idea that the UK would be a security risk is simply an acceptable comment from the European Commission. Sir Richard Benyon. Would my Honourable Friend agree? that it is crucial that any synergies in terms of industrial strategy across military expenditure should be concentrated on NATO, where there are a plethora of different weapon systems and different uh, pieces of equipment. And it's much more important to concentrate on the fact that Britain is remaining a key player in the NATO alliance. Yeah. Minister. Well, well, I agree entirely with my noble friend that uh, NATO is obviously the mainstay of our defence capabilities. Uh, and I would agree that the relationship with NATO partners is significant and important moving forward. But from an industrial capability perspective, I think the Prime Minister made a very clear commitment to our willingness to work with our European partners moving forward, and I hope that the same goodwill will be, will, goodwill will be shown by the European Union partners in return. Graham Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our sovereign military aerospace capability is really important, yet the typhoon orders only last till 2026. We've no new orders now for the Hawk, unless the Qatar deal comes through. Tyrannis is kept in this big hangar and we don't really know what's happening with that. So where are we with our UK aerospace defence industries? Because it it takes at least 10 years lead time. So what discussions has he had over the sixth generation strike fighter, for example, to protect Britain's future sovereign capability? Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his, for his questioning, and I would g- give him some reassurance that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, will be me- meeting with the Qatari Defence Minister later this afternoon in relation to the typhoon and hawk orders in relation to Qatar. But he is absolutely right in highlighting the long time it takes to develop new capabilities, which is exactly why we have launched the Combat Air Strategy, with a view of ensuring that we do have a future idea in terms of how we move this issue forward. The United Kingdom has hu- huge capability in this sphere, and we need to build upon that. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The United Kingdom uh, defence expenditure accounts for about 20% of the total EU defence expenditure. What is being done to encourage our allies to up their defence spending? Minister. Well, I agree entirely with the sentiments expressed by my honourable friend. And I think it's fair to say that uh, ministers, including myself, uh, when we do meet with our opposite numbers from the European Union, do stress the need for other countries within the European Union who are within NATO to ensure that they do meet that 2% obligation. And it's interesting to note that some of the Baltic states, for example, are very clear in that commitment. But we need to see some of the larger players within Europe meet their obligations as well. Bambos, Charalambos. Uh, question 9, Mr. Speaker. With permission, Mr Speaker, I should like to answer questions 9, 15, 17 and 19 together. I have regular discussions with the Chancellor, and as the Prime Minister announced last month, the Ministry of Defence will benefit from an extra £800 million this financial year, including £600 million for the Dreadnought submarine programme. This Government is committed to spending at least 2% of GDP on defence, and the defence budget will rise at least 0.5% above inflation every year of this Parliament. The modernising defence programme will ensure our armed forces have the right processes and capabilities to address evolving threats. Ambos, Charalambos. The Defence Select Committee said in a recent report... We seriously doubt the MOD's ability to generate the efficiencies required to deliver the equipment plan. How can we be confident in the government's ability to deliver, even with an enhanced budget, when the MDP is seemingly focused on efficiencies when the budget is already over-reliant on projected savings? Part of the reason that we are doing the Modernising Defence Programme is to look at how we can drive efficiencies out of the system, make sure that we deliver on the commitments that we need to make, and also look at how the changing threat environment, uh, how we respond to that. Uh, That is why we took the decision to take uh, defence out of the National Security Capability Review, because we recognised that we needed flexibility in the system in order to deal with the changing threat picture. Mr Marcus Fish. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One one way to make sure we have enough money to spend on defence is to take full account of British industry's opportunities and contribution when making procurement decisions. End-to-end helicopter manufacturing in the South West is a strategic asset supporting over 10,000 jobs and 700 million of exports. Will he discuss with me developing a specific defence industrial strategy for helicopters? So if you stay. The Honourable Gentleman is a strong advocate uh, of this issue and also defender of jobs in his constituency. We are committed to spending over £3 billion uh, with Leonardo over the next uh, 10 years, but I would be very happy to meet with him to discuss how we can start developing our strategy going forward. It is not just in terms of manned rotary, but also unmanned rotary. What are the options, what are the opportunities that we can exploit and make sure our world-leading industry continues to hold that top spot. Leo Doherty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful for the progress that the Secretary of State is making in securing additional funding for defence. As these discussions continue, can he uh, reassure the House that the needs of our enhanced forward presence in Estonia are taken into consideration and that they receive the firepower and protection they need? I, I can assure my honourable friend of that, and I recently visited our enhanced forward presence in Estonia, and it's pleasing to be able to announce that we will be adding to that presence with uh, uh, more wildcats being uh, stationed uh, in Estonia in order to support the operations well that are there, and an additional 70 well personnel also joining. Eleanor Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The National Audit Office found that the MOD had not included £9.6 billion of forecast costs in the 2017 equipment plan. Including the cost of buying the Type 31E frigates, does the Secretary of State think that this kind of mismanagement is likely to help his discussion with the Chancellor about additional funding? Today. Our armed forces are looking very closely at everything that we've committed towards investing in. And with that changing threat environment, we're looking at how we can do things more efficiently. How can we make our money go further? But what do we need going forward to deal with those increasing threats? I'm very confident that we can put a strong argument to the whole of government of the importance that defence is to our nation's security. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number 10. 
Minister Elwood. Mr Speaker, the Armed Force aims to attract talent from the widest possible base from across the UK. The skills, education, training and experience, as well as enhanced reverence for our country, enables recruits from a variety of backgrounds to progress as far as their aptitude will take them, regardless of their socio-economic background, their educational status or their ethnicity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know in many of our cities at the moment some young people feel trapped that their only life choice is which gang to join. Can the, my right honourable friend explain what the armed forces are going to do to help reach into those communities and help those young people transform their life chances? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend raises a very important issue. I, I recall uh, as a platoon commander, I got to know my soldiers very well indeed, and they came from a variety of backgrounds, and some from very tough backgrounds indeed, and we're forever grateful of the sense of purpose, the second chance, if you like, a new direction that the armed force provides. So I think it's uh, correct to say that whether you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth or indeed uh, had a penchant for pinching them, you will be treated with the same set of uh, irreverence, if you like, Cur- discourteous irreverence by the sergeant major when you arrive on the parade square, who will knock you into something that both the armed force and indeed the nation can be proud of. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, when a young person leaves the school, perhaps in a deprived area, and joins the armed forces and makes a success of that career, what encouragement is being given to this same young person to go back to that school and say, look, I was in this school, I know where you smoke the fags behind the bike sheds, you too can make a success of a career like mine? Minister. Again, I'm pleased that the Honourable Gentleman raises that issue. We're looking at ways that we can actually encourage and reward those who go back to their peer groups and to say, I have benefited from the armed forces. And let's not forget that those who do sign up to wear the uniform are not only a benefit of service to the armed force themselves, but they take away transitional skills of leadership, determination, grit, tenacity and uh, teamwork that can then make that transfer into uh, society as a whole. Everybody benefits from a life in the armed force. Well, I must call the Honourable Gentleman because I think he comes from the wing of the Conservative Party that went to state school, pays mortgages and buys its own furniture. Mr Simon Hoare. Uh, Mr Speaker, you are you definitely an EPNS family, I have to say. But I welcome everything that my right honourable friend has said from the dispatch box. And following up from the honourable gentleman um, from the Liberal benches, rather than just using those who have been in the military, what opportunity is there to use active champions who are currently serving in our armed forces to take that message of social mobility yeah, 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 into yeah. schools and colleges oh, in areas that really need to hear it and will benefit from hearing it? Oh, and young Hall. Minister. Well, he raises again an important issue. At a time when we are looking to improve recruitment and indeed retention, one aspect of this is the cadetship programme, which is growing every single year. And that actually invites those who already have a connection in the armed forces to go back to the very communities that they start off with to say, I have benefited from my time, my service uh, in uniform. It's grateful to the Minister. Catherine West. Question number 11, Mr Speaker. Minister Elwood. Mr Speaker, the MOD strives to attract the brightest and the best from across the country, whether they are in uniform as part of the civil service or indeed are serving in our armed forces. They deserve to have fulfilling jobs that are fairly rewarded. In response to a recent parliamentary question, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions (laughs) informed me that cleaners within her Whitehall department were paid the London living wage. However, when I asked the same question of the Secretary of State for Defence, I was referred to an earlier answer in which his ministers admitted that they did not know how much MOD cleaners were paid. Could the minister take this opportunity to clarify why he does not know the salary levels of low-paid staff in his department? And will he promise not just to find out, but pledge to ensure all cleaners of his Whitehall department are paid the London living wage? Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady asks a very detailed but important question. There are 3,000 staff that are paid the national minimum wage. I will certainly look into the details of the cleaners itself because there does seem to be a discrepancy in the answers that she was given, and I will resolve to uh, sort that out for her. 
Alex Chalk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Cybersecurity experts at GCHQ and my constituency are in the front line of our nation's defences as never before. And although they didn't join up for the money, their skills are much in the demand in the private sector. Does my right honourable friend agree that paying our cyber experts fairly has never been more important for national security? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend raises an important point, and it is something that we're looking at to ensure that we may need to require transferable skills from other units. There's two approaches to this. We either can grow the skill set from the start, or we can outsource and look to working with other companies uh, as well. When it comes to cybersecurity, it is very important that we have the talent to allow us to make sure that our cyber offensive and defensive is very, very strong. And to that end, we need to make sure that we pay them the correct salaries. And colleagues needn't worry. Their questions will be reached. But the Chair has to react to the development of events, uh, to which I and some colleagues are privy and others are not. And if you weren't already confused, you will now be. <laughs> David Hanson. Uh, number 16, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Minister. Don't worry, Mr Speaker. I'll endeavour to speak very slowly for a change and maybe at length. Um, we have a strong and enduring defence relationship with our allies in the Baltic states. Since April last year, UK forces have been deployed in Estonia as part of NATO's enhanced forward presence. The UK acts as a framework nation in Estonia, leading a defensive but combat-capable multinational battle group to deter aggression. The UK also contributes to the US-led EFP battle group in Poland. David Hansen. Uh, this may be my opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to do a lecture on uh, Estonian, Lithuanian, and Polish relations with the UK, whilst uh, keeping you happy in your chair. But in the meantime, uh, could the Minister indicate? Uh, I very much welcome what the Secretary of State said about the increased support to the Baltic states. But could the Minister also look at the possibility of giving training and support to members of the Baltic states armed forces in the UK? Because he will be aware that in a recent parliamentary question, uh, no one from Lithuania, Latvia or Poland has attended the MOD's highest profile UK based courses. I think that's something he could look at and try to rectify. Minister, I'd be delighted to look at it. In, indeed, the House, um, I'm sure, would be delighted to know that um, last week when I was travelling in East Africa, the one request I got from just about every nation was to have further training uh, course places on UK um, uh, training courses. So, for example, our Royal College of Defence Studies, our Advanced Command and Staff course, our Higher Command and Staff course, or even at Sanders, the places on these courses are incredibly valued by overseas nations. Unfortunately, um, demand exceeds supply, but I'll look very carefully at what more we can do to support our Baltic colleagues. This twist. Question 18. Minister. With permission, Mr Speaker, I should like to answer questions 18 and 24 together. We are committed to maintaining the overall size of the armed forces. The services are meeting all their current commitments, keeping the country and its interests safe. Ms Twist. According to a recent report by the National Audit Office, at the current rate of recruitment, the RAF estimates it will be another 20 years before it has enough pilots. What urgent steps is the Secretary of State taking to rectify this? Well, I don't, I don't recognise those figures, actually. I mean, certainly we've just done a uh, review of the pilot training scheme, which will shorten and simplify that process, which hasn't changed much, actually, in the last 30 years. One of the challenges we face, actually, is because of the um, success in some of our uh, selling of aircraft overseas, that some of our pilot training uh, system is occupied by overseas pilots. So we need to look very carefully at how we find that balance to ensure that with the limited capacity we do have, we can, con we can continue to train all the pilots we need. Jill Furness. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A recent National Audit Office report found a 26% shortfall in staffing of intelligence analysis in the armed forces. These specialists are crucial to our UK national security and our fight against cyber crime. Mr Speaker, given the threats of information warfare from a variety of disparate groups, from terrorist organisations to states like Russia, does the Minister agree with me that you can't keep our country safe on the cheap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Minister. Well, we're certainly not keeping our country safe on the cheap, which is why we're committed to spending more than 2% of GDP, and our defence budget will continue to rise from the £36 billion this year. Where I do agree with her is where we need to find innovative solutions when it comes to uh, recruiting our cyber specialists, and that is precisely why uh, we are now doing just that in the reserve space, and we have changed the rules about who can join uh, and their backgrounds, and it's proving to be a tremendous success. John Mann. Number 20, sir. Minister. Last year, the Department deployed the British Army to Malawi for four months to run counter-poaching training in support of the Foreign Secretary's aim to combat the illegal wildlife trade, a role that plays to the strengths of our young commanders and soldiers who are experts in fieldcraft tactics and intelligence fusion. It is a testament to the quality of their training of the rangers that arrests in Lewande, Malawi, have increased by some 50 per cent. Mr Speaker, with our ivory trade ban and with our summit this autumn, what an opportunity to assist this work in Africa, but also to give some of our armed forces real-time experience in training, but also potentially in the use of drones. Could we not expand this training opportunity alongside the summit this autumn? Well, I'm delighted to report that after the success of this pilot project, which has been funded for three years, we will indeed be doing exactly that, and we'll be expanding this programme to two more wildlife parks in Malawi. And this sits exactly within the priority of Her Majesty's Government's um, Africa strategy, which runs across all three departments. Yes, Mr. Jeremy Lefroy. Uh, thank you very much. Could I ask the Minister if he's also had discussions with the Government of the United Republic of Tanzania, where there have been huge losses of elephants over the last uh, 20 years, particularly uh, in the Salu Game Reserve? I wonder if, uh, if he hasn't had those. Perhaps it would be something that could be offered to the United Republic of Tanzania. Uh, Indeed, poaching is responsible for the deaths of, of approximately 20,000 elephants every year, which is why I'm delighted that we seem to have made such a positive impact in this pilot project over the last year. Uh, and as, of, as I've already mentioned, as part of the government's Africa strategy, we will be looking to expand it. Really? Speaker, question 25. Um, Secretary of State. Oh, Mr Speaker, I must confess I didn't really expect to get to this question. Um, <laughs> you're, you're not the only one. <laughs> Uh, official development assistance or aid exists to support the welfare or economic development of recipient countries as such military activity can only be reported as aid in certain very limited circumstances as defined by the OECD. Nevertheless, the Ministry of Defence budget assumes £5 million per year or 0.01% of a budget for activity that may be counted as aid. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for uh, getting through the order paper. Uh, can the Secretary of State confirm then that uh, the recent military action in Surrey and none of uh, the money was spent financing that will be in any way counted towards uh, the aid budget? Uh, I, I can confirm that's the case. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, there's sometimes with a certain element of sadness, there is so much that the Ministry of Defence does and our armed forces do uh, that actually can't be counted towards aid expenditure. And I look at uh, the peacekeeping that we do in South Sudan. Uh, we look at the hurricane relief that we did in the Caribbean. Uh, just those two operations alone come to £100 million worth of expenditure, none of which can be counted as humanitarian aid and support, which I think we'd all in this House agree it most certainly is. Appreciate it. Very human. Order. Topical questions. Robert Courts. Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to thank all of our armed forces who played a leading role in the recent targeted strike to degrade and deter the Syrian regime's ability to use chemical weapons. Their skill and professionalism, alongside our US and French allies, were second to none. Robert Court. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, for reasons of development time and capability, combat air strategy cannot come soon enough. Uh, would ministers please uh, confirm that the Modernising Defence Review will include consideration of potential national partners so that the export consequences, uh, as well as the work share, uh, ramifications of potential partnering with the United States, Europe or an Eastern partner, can be assessed and assessed in good time? Secretary of State. 
I, I, I'm afraid I probably won't be able to give my uh, honourable friend quite the answer that he wants, as we probably won't be looking at that as part of a modernising defence programme. But as part of our combat air strategy, we are looking at how we can develop those alliances. And we may have to start looking further afield, not just our traditional European allies, but there is a world market out there. How can we develop new relationships with different countries and develop our future sixth generation combat aircraft with them? Neil Griffith. Mr. Speaker, um, well, can the Secretary of State uh, confirm that the welfare of Armed Forces personnel and their families is still a core responsibility of his department? Uh, yes, I can. Neil Griffith. Thank you very much indeed for, for that answer. Um, so, taking that as a yes, how is it then that over half a million pounds of LIBOR funds has been spent by the MOD in support of armed forces welfare when the Minister for Defence People has said categorically that LIBOR funding should not be used to fund departmental core responsibilities? Isn't it time now for the Secretary of State to admit that this was a serious misjudgment using the LIBOR funds in this scandalous way? And can he tell us when his department will be paying this money back? Hey. I'm sure the Honourable Lady will be very well aware that it's not actually the Ministry of Defence that uh, administers uh, LIBOR funding, it is the Treasury. And uh, so much of that LIBOR funding has made such a difference, not just to those who have ceased to serve in our armed forces, but a real difference to those who continue to serve in our armed forces. And we're very grateful uh, for the impact that that has had and the positive impact it's had on so many of our services. Mrs Pauline Latham. Um, could the Minister inform the House as to how the new Veterans Gateway is rolling out in providing s support to those calling the helpline now that it's been running for a year? Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, I pay tribute to the charities, the, the uh, large numbers of charities that we have that support our military sector, our armed forces community. There are over 400 of them. And for an individual personnel, it can be unclear where to turn to. The Gateway has been fundamental in being, allowing individuals unsure where to turn to for support to provide that help. And I'm delighted that I'll be visiting the Gateway uh, uh, in the next couple of months. John Grogan. The historic and continuing defence ties between the United Kingdom and Korea will ministers do all they can to encourage the remarkable peace process which is gathering pace and the aim of ridding the entire peninsula of nuclear weapons. Uh, we continue to work very closely with our allies, uh, not just South Korea, Japan and the United States, in trying to bring about a peaceful solution uh, to the challenges on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are also uh, very proud that we have uh, uh, HMS Sutherland uh, conducting operations uh, in the theatre and actually supporting uh, all of our aims to get a peaceful resolution to the challenges that we face in Korea. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In addition to the 20,000 MOD personnel in Scotland, the 1.6 billion spent by the Department with Scottish industry supporting 10,500 private sector jobs, the SOS cut uh, the Secretary of State rather, cut tariff for RAF Lossiemouth. Would my right honourable friend confirm the new Poseidon submarine hunters will play a vital strategic role for the UK and NATO alliance? Yeah. So it goes to show our commitment and investment to Scotland, and it's something that I know that my honourable friend and his colleague on our benches has been championing uh, continuously. And uh, not only do we have the investment in terms of the Poseidon aircraft, but also the fact and the very welcome news that another Typhoon squadron will also be based at Lossiemouth going forward. Stephen Lloyd. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. To be willing to put one's life on the line for our nation, we all in this chamber respect across all parties. Uh, I had a meeting a week or so ago with a homeless former veteran who had come down from the north of England to Eastbourne. Uh, clearly, this man had served the, con the country for many, many years. Clearly, also, sadly, he did have mental health issues at my office. Myself, are trying our very best to support him as best we can. What I would like to ask the Secretary of State is, is there something within the MOD, within the armed services, that allows people who are in this situation, A, to actually go directly for support, but B, to actually, uh, to, to, to actually, is it tracked in any way that uh, the MOD would know these individuals and their issues? I must say to the Honourable Gentleman, in all courtesy and friendliness, that I was about to offer him an adjournment debate on the matter until I realised that he'd just conducted it. Minister. 
Um, Mr Speaker, the support for veterans does not only come from the MOD, but it comes from a wide variety of departments across Whitehall. And that's one of the reasons why we've set up the Veterans Board, which is chaired by the Defence Secretary, that brings together the other representatives, indeed the Secretaries of States from these departments. It is clear that we need local councils to do more to recognise the homelessness issue and the housing issue to make sure that those who have served are not disadvantaged because of their service. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, on July the 1st of 1918, 134 workers were killed, and they were mainly Canary girls, were killed in a terrible explosion at the National Shell Filling Factory at Chilwell in my constituency. Uh, would my honourable friend uh, please ensure that DIO, Defence Infrastructure Organisation, makes good the memorial at the Chetwynd Barracks in good time for the centenary commemorations which the community very much wants to support? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's appropriate for the whole House to pay tribute to all those who supported uh, the war effort, including the Canary Girls themselves, who actually were called that because of uh, build, building, putting together the munitions that actually turned their hands and indeed their complexion rather yellow. And it is important that we also pay tribute to that. I will certainly endeavour to look into where the memorial is and uh, get back to her. Julie Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Although ships are no longer built in the North East, there are many companies in the engineering supply chain. What will the government what steps will the government do to ensure that work comes to the North East on future defence contracts? Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. I think one example we can offer is the current uh, Boxer programme, which is at the assessment phase. Uh, currently, we expect over 60 per cent of that to be onshored into the UK, but there are opportunities to increase that further, and I have already had discussions with several companies based in the North East on that very project. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on from my honourable friend's remarks earlier about the cadet force, does he agree with me that the cadets are a great introduction to military life, as well as giving children positive role models? It helps to promote social mobility. And can he update the House on what steps the department is taking to encourage the participation of state schools in the cadet movement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stay. I think what our cadets do is absolutely extraordinary right across the country, and we've had a rollout of 500 new cadet uh, units uh, this year. And and the ability to promote social mobility, the ability to give uh, youngsters an opportunity to really succeed in life, that's what our armed forces do. And uh, the cadet units are a brilliant way of giving young people the opportunity to get a taste of military life, but also provide those role models. And the question we need to be asking is, can we be doing more to inspire young people in our schools? And I think the answer to that is a most certain yes. Liz McInnes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In their future partnership paper, the government said the UK will remain a committed partner and ally to its friends across the continent. Does the Secretary of State think the decision to withdraw the offer of leadership of the EU battle group reinforces or undermines that statement? Good question. Let's be absolutely clear. Britain has been guaranteeing the security of, uh, of continental Europe long before the creation uh, of the European Union. And let us also be clear that the security of Europe, uh, its foundation is on NATO, it is not on the European Union. And our commitment, our commitment to the security of the uh, continental Europe is unwavering, and we will play a leadership role on European battle groups in the future, but it is an opportunity for another country to take the opportunity to do that this coming year. Kirsten Hare. I was delighted to welcome the Secretary of State to our M. Condor in my constituency of Angus last week to see the fantastic work of the Royal Marines there. I was equally delighted at his recent announcement to, to try to mitigate the, t the tax from the SNP Government in Scotland, which is um, unfairly put on our brave service personnel. Can my right honourable friend give me an update on the progress of that area? Yeah, uh, certainly. Well, I, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues who have campaigned so hard to highlight the fact that 70 per cent of service personnel who are based in Scotland are going to be worse off as a result of uh, Scottish Government's NAT tax that they are placing on our brave service personnel. We hope to be able to report back in the next six weeks as to the conclusions on this, and we don't want anyone who serves in our armed forces to be worse off as a result of the taxes that have been placed on them by the SNP. 
Christian Matheson. You, Mr Speaker, has the Secretary of State had a chance to review the misguided policy of his predecessor to close the Dale Barracks in Chester, which has only recently been refurbished and which enjoys very high satisfaction rates amongst the soldiers who are stationed there and their families? Minister. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman will be aware that there is a tough rationalisation programme going on. Uh, the MED owns 2% of uh, UK, and uh, this is more land than we need. There is a requirement for us to build housing on this as well. We are having to take some very, very tough decisions in certain areas where colleagues, MPs, honourable uh, members will be concerned about. I'm more than happy to meet with the honourable gentleman to discuss his individual case uh, on a one-to-one. Order.